And our last song is Your Grace is Enough. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, so oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. So uh, how marvelous and how wonderful that uh, I can come up here and uh, pray for you guys because uh, I survived August the VBS. <laughs> and uh, so let's bow down and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day and uh, thank you that for each of, each of us here that can uh, come here with a sound body and we thank you that we have all these young people here and they are the uh, future of the of the church and in ccac and uh, now we pray together as as one to ask for your comfort and peace and blessings to those among us who has body bodily and spiritually they have the need and we pray that you will look after them and lift them up we pray also for the university students that are looking for accommodations um, for uh, a, in, uh, a job internship and uh, that they are um, uh, preparing for their schoolwork in the coming september we pray that you give them strength and then you also provide and walk with them in their journey. We also pray for those who are now working. We pray that during this economic downturn, they will have a um, stable job and then they can provide to their family and to themselves. We especially pray for those 
in this small group, adult small group retreat in Redeemer. We pray that they will receive a, the message from you. And we also pray for the safety for their, um, uh, their way home. And we also pray for their relationship with God and spiritual renewal, not only in the camp, but after, so that they can serve this church and serve the community and serve you. We also pray for what's happening around the world, for all this pandemic, uh, geopolitical tension, and pray for those poor and suppressed. We pray for their need and also pray for that they will know you one day and we will all see them when we see you in the heaven. We also pay, pray for the advancement of your kingdom and we especially pray for the, that we will be part of it. Also, we pray for our, uh, today's our speaker, Yvonne, that you will use her message and, and all of us will listen. We don't only hear your message, we listen and follow you and we pray all this name in your in your precious name. Amen. Hey, good morning, church. Um, yeah, so usually I don't do announcements, but um, yeah, we're going to do the announcements now. Okay. All right. This is just a reminder that um, you must always wear your masks when you're in the church. Um, so when you're in the basement, in the gym, you can take off your masks only if you're playing sports um, and if you're singing or eating, of course. Uh, let's see. Oh, prayer meeting. So prayer meeting is now on Wednesdays um, at 8 p.m. Join us if you can. Um, yeah, it's important to pray for our church and for the people. and. Uh, for unreached people groups. Uh, so come join us online. Uh, we have Sunday school that starts at 1115. Um, unfortunately, it's not online, but you can join us downstairs in the basement. Uh, I think there's one more announcement that was there. Oh, there's one for a small group retreat. So it's happening right now, as Pastor Anthony said. Um, just pray for the safety of the people there and also for their uh, the safety for them to come back home and that they're having a good and fruitful time there. Uh, yes, so there are more announcements in the bulletin. You can check online on our website. Um, yeah, so we'll do scripture reading. So if you can, open your Bibles or... Um, Turn with me to 1 King chapter 15, verse 9 to 15. I'm reading in NIV. Again, that's 1 King chapter 15, verse 9 to 15. Okay. This is the word of the Lord. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 41 years. His grandmother's name was Maka, daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother Maka from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning, brothers and sisters. Morning, and also uh, to the people who are worshiping with us on the internet. Um, it's great to be back 
on the pulpit and to be able to minister to you with God's word and his encouragement. Um, so uh, last few times when I was here, uh, we looked at quite a few royal women of the Bible and um, today we're gonna continue doing the same. We started off with, uh, actually can we have the PowerPoint please? We started off with uh, Queen Vashti in Esther 1, and then we also had the Queen of Sheba in 1 Kings 10. And then uh, the last time I was here, we um, looked at the forgotten princess, Maka, the daughter of Talmai, uh, king of Geshur in 2 Samuel. I know it's a mouthful. Um, princess Maka was a pagan wife of David, if you remember, and she bore him Prince Absalom, who was absolutely handsome, and Princess Tamar, who was uh, very, very beautiful, so beautiful that uh, she had a tragic um, uh, life. She was violated by her own half-brother, um, Amnon. And Absalom then murdered Amnon to avenge her fled to Geshur, his grandfather, and then later started a coup d'etat against his father, King David, but he failed, and he was eventually killed. Through Princess Maka's story, we learned a few lessons. Worldly desires cannot give us joyous life. Laws and morality cannot prevent evil. Sin can cause hardship in other people's lives. Now today, instead of looking at Maka number one, we'll be looking at Maka number two, which happens to be her great-granddaughter through Absalom. And I know this is going to be a little bit of a history story, but as the saying goes, history repeats itself. And the reason history repeats itself, most likely is because we never learned from history, and that's why God made these um, events happening again and again and again so that one day we will learn. So let us look at today's passage again. Now, um, I'll be using the NLT today, and that would be because um, the translation is more of a dynamic equivalence as opposed to literal, and um, therefore it's actually easier for us to understand. So if you're using a different translation, um, the, uh, some of the words may be a little bit different, but I'll be using the NLT. He says, uh, let's read the word again, um, the, the word of the Lord. Asa began to rule over Judah in the 20th year of Jeroboam's reign in Israel. He reigned in Jerusalem 41 years. His, great, his grandmother was Maka, the granddaughter of Absalom. Asa did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight as his ancestor David had done. He banished the male and female shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. He cut down the obscene pole and burned it in the Kitchen Valley. Although the pagan shrines were not removed, Asa's heart remained completely faithful to the Lord throughout his life. He brought into the temple the Lord, the silver and gold, and the various items that he had his father, um, he and his father had dedicated. So from this very short passage, we see quite a few facts. Verses 9 to 10 tells us that Asa was a king over Judah. Judah is actually um, after the, the kingdom of Solomon has split into two, Judah was the southern kingdom and Israel was the north. So today we'll be looking a lot at the conflicts between the two. We also see that he reigned for 41 years, 41 years. How many of you, well, maybe I shouldn't ask. I was gonna ask how many of you are over 41. Um, those of you who are, you know, I am. Okay. Um, 41 years he reigned in Judah which was one of the longest in the history of the Southern Kingdom. The other thing we learned about him was that he was quite a few generations removed from David because his grandmother was the granddaughter of David's son. And then verse 11 gave us God's comments on Asa. 
He says, um, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Why? And that was because in verses 12 to 13, we're told that he initiated a religious reform across the land by doing three things. Verse 12. He banished the shrine prostitutes. Now, these are Canaanite uh, cult prostitutes. Worshippers of the cult would actually have sexual relationship with them to induce agricultural or personal fertility. He also destroyed the pagan idols his ancestors had made, talking about his father and his grandfather and, and whoever else, right? And most drastically, he even, this is what the Bible says, he even deposed his grandmother, Maka, from the position as queen mother. Now, the word queen mother in Hebrew is gavira. The word is found 15 times, gavira, queen mother, or uh, the queen, um, in the Old Testament. Now, it is not only a description, it is actually an office title, an official position that was held by mothers of the, um, the kings in Judah. Now, the author of the Book of Kings recorded the names of royal mothers of 17 Judean kings, but none, zero for Israel, the northern kingdom. Generally, queen mothers have great influence over the king, not only personally, but also in the, tr in, in, in the government. An example was Bathsheba. Do you remember Bathsheba? She sat on her th own throne at the right side of Solomon. And the queen mothers were the king's counselors and the intercessors. She was um, helping by uh, helping other people by coming to King Solomon, for example, and uh, for for requests uh, that people were afraid to come directly to Solomon to. The Gavira or the queen mothers was clearly the most important and influential woman in the kingdom of Judah. Why? A king may have many wives but a king can only have one mother. Now in Chinese history, one of the most influential queen mothers was Empress Dowager uh, Qixi or Qihei, if some of you know um, the, um, uh, the queen mother of Chinese history. She was a uh, dowager of the Qing dynasty. She assumed the role of co-empress dowager when her young child became an emperor. Her control over Chinese royal court continued when her nephew was crowned after her son. And she was de facto ruler of China while those two emperors were merely puppets. Another powerful um, Empress Dowager was Empress Wu, Wu Zetian, Mo Zetian uh, of the seventh century during the Tang Dynasty. Again, this empress, she actually rose to power via her young son when he inherited the crown after the death of her husband. Could this be the same that is, being, uh, that is happening in Judah during the 900s BC? Marka's son, Abiah, died after reigning only three years. Asa may have been a minor when he became the next king. Maybe King Asa, uh, King Arthur's, uh, Arthur's mother, have died at that time already. Or perhaps the former Gevira, Marka, would not relinquish her power and authority upon the succession of the grandson. She may even have acted as a regent during his minority years. And only 15 years later, when King Asa was old enough to take back control, that's when he deposed her. Now, did Asa depose her, depose her, uh, his grandmother, Maka? Is that a political maneuver? No. The scriptures clearly states that it was for religious reasons. He even deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother because, because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. Now, what is an Asherah pole? Does anybody know? Asherah was often depicted naked. She was a Canaanite, a fertility goddess, a consort of Baal, Baal, the mother of 70, 70 Canaanite gods. 
and there was a very strong sexual overtone in her worship. The presence of prostitutes at as, as sacred, um, sacred Canaanite shrines was a very common feature. It was believed that worshiping her through having sex with these temple prostitutes would produce fertility for crops and fertility for animals and, of course, for humans too. Now, the Asherah pole is described here as an obscene pole. Now, different Bible translations have used um, different words to, um, to, to describe this. I'm afraid we're out of, oh, sorry, never mind. Battery's good. Um, different Bible translations have used different words to, to describe this. Repulsive, horrid, abominable, the Message Bible even calls it shockingly obscene. Now, this reminds me of uh, one of the short-term mission trips that I took to Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a very liberal city uh, from, from uh, a morality standpoint. It's kind of the de facto capital city of the Netherlands. And it was one of the first, the Netherlands was one of the first countries to legalize cannabis, sex trade, drugs, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, casino, you name it. You can even get weed in a local coffee shop. You don't go to coffee shop for coffee, you go to coffee shop for weed. If you want to go for coffee, you go to a cafe. Okay, so, so for those of you who, who go to, to Amsterdam, be, be very careful when you walk into a coffee shop, okay? Over there, even in the churches among Christians, it was very common for Christian couples to move in together before marriages, before marrying each other. Now, the most shocking impression that the city made on me was to see the barricades between the sidewalks and the roads. You know those barricades are the obstacles that prevent cars from crashing into, um, in, onto the pedestrians? Those barricades, concrete, were made in the shape of male sex organs, blatantly, out in the open, under broad daylight. The Asherah poles of the ancient time in Judah may produce similar effects as these barricades. You look at it, your face blushes. Except the Asherah pole would be carved out of wood instead of concrete. Most likely it is a lofty pillar placed next to the altar of Baal or Baal. Now you may ask, how? How did all of these cultic practices penetrate the land of Judah? I mean, what happened to the temple worship of Yahweh? To answer these questions, we'll have to go back to Solomon's time. But before we do that, let's take a look at Marcus' various identities in the royal court of Judah and of her life first. Now, the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles um, provide different perspectives to some of the same history events in the kingdom of Judah. Sometimes we need to put them side by side next to each other in order to see a more complete picture of all the events. And it is the case here in Marcus' life. So chronologically speaking, pun intended, Martha first appeared in the Bible in 2 Chronicles 11, where we were told that later, Rehoboam married another cousin, Martha, the granddaughter of Absalom, Martha, gave birth to Abiah and a bunch of other people. Rehoboam loved Martha more than any of his other wives and concubines. In all, he had 18 wives and 60 concubines, and they gave birth to 28 sons and 60 daughters. Rehoboam appointed Makkah's son, Abiah, as leader among the princes, making it clear that he would be the next king. So now we have a pretty messy family tree. Because Rehoboam was 41 when he became the king of Judah, and in those days, people tend to marry um, when they were in the teens or in early 20s. It is very likely that the, uh, he actually married Makkah while Solomon was still very young, uh, was still the king. And notice the number of wives and concubines each of these uh, golden people, the kings, had. We'll come back to this later on, okay? Now, the two, two time, uh, the next two times that Makkah appeared in the scriptures were 
First King 15.2 and Second Chronicles 13.2. Now, these two references did not actually add any more relevant facts to her life, so we're, we're just going to skip it uh, for uh, skip both of them for now. But the last time Maka was mentioned in the Bible was First Kings 15, and its parallel passage in Second Chronicles 15, telling telling us that she was the grandmother of King Asa. So we now have the complete family tree. But why does this matter? What does that have anything to do with us? This is so that we have a glimpse of what she had actually seen and experienced through her long life on earth. Now remember, we said that we had to go back to Solomon's time to figure out how paganism penetrated the land of Judah. We have to backtrack to 1 Kings 11 where Solomon took wives from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. These pagan wives turned his heart to worship other gods, and he built shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to the gods. So that was Solomon's time when Maka was a young girl or recently married. And then Rehoboam, Rehoboam was his son, uh, Solomon's son through his Ammonite, uh, Ammonite's wife, Nama. When Solomon died and Rehoboam became the next king, Rehoboam's favorite wife, Maka, would have witnessed how the northern tribe revolt against um, him in 1 Kings 12. The northern people, 10 tribes in all, they refused to be ruled by the descendant of David and made Jeroboam the king of the north instead. At that point, only the tribe of Judah in the south remained loyal, and the tribe of Benjamin, it keeps flip-flopping between the two. But meanwhile, not all that was lost. Second Chronicles 11 says, many priests and Levites who were living in the north moved to Judah in Jerusalem, and they were followed by others who sincerely wanted to worship the Lord. They supported Rehoboam and strengthened the, the kingdom of Judah. But the good time did not last. Three years later, during Rehoboam's reign, 1 Kings 14 tells us that the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of the ancestors. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree. Now, I am a cyclist, so um, whenever I bike along like in, in any, any, any um, uh, roads, um, say for example in Markham or anywhere in York region in Toronto, I notice there are lots and lots of high hills, even in a flat place like Markham. Every high hills have a shrine um, to the Asherah, and they were even um, there were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. So years and years ago, Israel driven all the pagans away from Canaan, and now they are practicing pagan worship. It doesn't only take place in the royal court because of Solomon's many pagans' wives, but it is now also practiced among the commoners. And Rehoboam saw all of this happen and did nothing about it. So in the fifth year of his reign, Second Chronicles 12 says, because the people of Judah were unfaithful to the Lord, King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. A prophet then confronted uh, Rehoboam and declared to him, you have abandoned Yahweh, so Yahweh is abandoning you to Shishak. Then the leaders of, the, of Israel and the king humbled themselves and Yahweh spared them and did not destroy him completely. In the end, the Egyptians rans ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple, took all of the gold objects out of the temple, everything including all the gold shields that, that Solomon has made, and the royal palaces, including all, um, and that would be 
for example, all of the jewelries of all the queens of Rehoboam. So Maka would have seen her gold chains, her gold rings, her anything jewelries belonging to her stripped away from her body, stripped away from the royal treasuries and taken away to Egypt. So all of this happened during Rehoboam's reign. And the chronicles conclude in chapter 12, verse 14, that Rehoboam was an evil king, for he did not seek the Lord with all his heart. And his wife, Maka, was witness to all of these events. And then Rehoboam died. Maka then witnessed the short reign of her son Abiah, who is also known as Abayam, in the first book of Kings. Second Chronicles 13 tells us that when the war broke out between Abiah of the south and Jeroboam of the north, he was outnumbered two to one. Have you ever fought? Have you ever fought with two other people when four feasts against yours? Or, um, I don't know, people who are outnumbering you two to one? The chances of winning is very little. But Abiah stood on the battlefront and shouted to Jeroboam and all of Israel, and he charged them with three sins, saying that, that they had ignored the, the, uh, the covenant with David by breaking away. They were worshiping the golden calves made by Jeroboam, and they had expelled the legitimate priest of Yahweh. He then predicted that Judah would win the battle after crying out to the Lord for help. God inflicted a crushing defeat on the double-sized army of northern Israel and southern Judah pushed its border out, conquering a few, a few cities in the north. Now, on the surface, King Abiah seemed to have good theology and was dependent on God during at least this very one battle against the north. But 1 Kings 15, 1 to 5 says that his reign um, during his reign, he committed the same sins as his father before him, and he was not faithful to the Lord the God, his God as his ancestor David had been. The Bible did not tell us how he died, but it does say that he only reigned in Jerusalem for three short years. In another word, within three years' time, Maka mourned for the death of her husband, King Rehoboam, and also for the death of her son, King Abiah. And finally, we come to the passage that was read earlier. 1 Kings 15, 9, 15 tells us that Asa became the next king and reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. It also tells us that he carried out a few actions which earned him the reputation of doing what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, as his ancestor David had done. But the passage omits a very important event during his reign. According to 2 Chronicles 14, verses 3 to 8, Asa carried out two reforms. The first one is he removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestor, and to obey his law and his commands. Asa also removed the pagan shrine as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. And then Asa told the people of Judah, let us build towns and fortify them with walls, towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we sought the Lord our God, and he has given us peace on every side. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors. That's basically the size of uh, the population of Makam, okay? 300,000 warriors, uh, including children and, and, and women, okay? Uh, in Makam. From the tribe of Judah, Armed with large shields and spears, he also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, basically, again, the same uh, population of Richmond Hill. 
300,000 plus 280 armed with small shields and bowls. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. Shields, bowls, spears. Then, verses 9 to 14, the chronicle tells us about Zara, the uh, Ethiopian army commander with more than twice as many warriors, plus not only spears and shields and bowls, but 300 chariots, which Judah did not have. They attempted to invade Judah. So Asa, uh, uh, Asa then cried out to the Lord his God and says, O oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O oh Lord our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against the vast horde. O oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. The Lord defeated the Ethiopian in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled, and the army of Judah carried off a vast plunder. After the victory against the Ethiopian army that is more than twice as big, God then sent Azariah the, to Asa and encouraged him. Now, all of these are in Chronicles. It's not in Kings. It says... Listen to me, oh, sorry, Azariah says, um, uh, the, the prophet says to the king, listen to me, Asa, listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you'll find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them, and without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. During those dark times, referring to the times of um, judges, it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled the people of every land. Nation fought against nations, and city against city, for God was troubling them with every kind of problems. But as for you, be strong and courageous. Hmm, sounds like Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for your work will be rewarded. And therefore, because of the prophet's encouragement, King Asa then went on to carry out the second reform in the nation after he defeated the invaders. I know it's a lot of Bible, but um, let us read the, the, the Bible um, and, and read the word of God, right? It's, it's an encouragement for us. When Asa heard the message from Azariah the prophet, just like we are hearing the message, he took courage and removed all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin, and in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim, so both in the south and in the north. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which st uh, stood in front of the entry room of the Lord's temple. Now, it has been more than 60 years since the, the temple was up in, uh, from Solomon's time, so yes, imagine if this church was 60 years old. The altars probably needs a little bit of a, a rework or need a bit of a repair. And then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin along with the people of Ephraim. This is uh, verse 9. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them. So there were quite a few people from the north came to the south and settled among them. Why? For many from Israel had moved to Judah. Migration or immigration during Asa's reign when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. People were attracted when the Lord is with us. The people gathered at Jerusalem in late spring during the 15th year of Asa's reign. On that day, the 15th year of his reign, they sacrificed to the Lord a bunch of sheep and animals and cows and, and goats and whatever from the plunder that they had taken from the battle. And then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestor, with all their heart and soul. With all their heart and soul. They agreed that anyone who refused to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, would be put to death. 
whether young or old, man or woman. They shouted out through, uh, uh, they shouted out their oath of loyalty to the Lord with trumpets blaring and ram's horns sounding. All in Judah was happy about this covenant, for they had entered into it with all their heart. They, they earnestly sought after God, and they found him. And the Lord gave them rest from enemies on every side. King Asa even deposed, this is going back a similar parallel to the other passage in First Kings. Uh, in Chronicles, it says, King Asa even deposed his grandmother, Maka from her position as queen mother because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. He cuts down her obscene pole, broke it up, and burned it in Kidron Valley. Although the pagan shrines were not removed from Israel, Asa's heart remained completely faithful throughout his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the various items that he and his father had his dedicated. So there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reigns. Now, I know I have given a big, long list of events that took place during the long life of Queen uh, Mother, Queen Mother Maka. Earlier, when Jared was asking me, uh, what passage are you going to read? And I was like, well, I have a lot of passages. Now you know what I mean, right? <laughs> she had witnessed throughout her long life and experienced throughout her long life, throughout the reigns of multiple kings, many times the victories and failures of her father-in-law, her husband, her son, and her grandson. Even then, even till the end, as if she was mad, she just would not repent from her own sin, and she would not stop worship the wooden obscene Asherah pole, one that, has made, that was made by human hands, one that caused her ultimate fate, demise, and disgrace. Now, what about us? when we are faced with the numerous examples presented here in the lives of these kings, are we just as mad and stubborn and unmoved as Maka was? Now, I'll use the acrostics M-A-D to summarize the lessons that we're to learn from the lives of Maka and each of the kings related to her. M is for moral. Deuteronomy 17.17 17 has specifically warned the Israelites that their king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. This is during Moses' time. Decades later, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abiah, all of them took many, many wives and many, many concubines and had many, many, many sons and many, many, many daughters. Despite God's instructions from the time of Moses and the warning of the contemporary prophets, they just would not let go of the moral practices. And then there were the cultic prostitutes that we mentioned earlier, sexual practices associated with pagan worship. Each of the successive kings failed to learn from the errors of their father. Now, before we pass judgment on the kings and the people of Judah, Perhaps we better examine our own lives and our church. When it comes to sexual immorality or morality, even born again people don't live much differently from those who are unsaved. Materialistic and humanistic idols are both tolerated and promoted even among ourselves. The Lord punished Solomon, Rehoboam, Abiah, how long would it be before the Lord punishes us? Today, we live in a morally bankrupt society. We have freedom to do many, many things that are acceptable by the surrounding cultures. But we are not to conform to this world. We are to be transformed by God. Our lives are ultimately being measured not by the world standard. Whether we're successful or not, whether we do the right things in God is measured by God's standard. A is for attitude. Amaka had not seen only once, but three times how when the nation was under attack, the attitude of each of the kings, 
her husband, her son, and her grandson, literally um, because of their attitudes, it changed the, court, uh, the, the course of history. When Shishak, the Egyptian king, was sweeping across the land of Judah after the prophet pointed out that the invasion was brought on because they have abandoned God, all it took was Micah's husband, King Rehoboam, to humble himself. God stopped destroying Jerusalem because of his change of heart. On the other hand, Micah also saw how all the treasures of the temple and the royal palaces, including her own personal jewelries, were all stripped away and taken away by the invader. Yet, after all of this, she would not repent. And then she saw her son, King Abiah, gave a sermon to the army of the northern uh, kingdom in, about the legitimacy of their reign and the illegitimacy of Jeroboam. And then when he cried out to God while the smaller army was facing the enemies on two different fronts, the battle was miraculously won because of God's help. She saw how the northern army went from twice the size of his son's army to three quarter of the size. She saw how Judah expanded the border because they trusted in the Lord, yet she would not repent. Then Maka also saw how her grandson, King Asa, cried out to the Lord for help when facing the Ethiopian, this time threefold the size of their army. And add to that, they had the most advanced military weapon of the day, being the chariots. But once again, the Lord defeated those people on Judah's behalf. She saw how much plunder Asa brought back from the battle, how many sheep and goats and camels and that, that were captured when they returned to Jerusalem. Yet, she would not repent. Faced with the evidences that humbleness and dependence on the Lord brought relief to Judah, not once, not twice, but three times, yet she was still stubborn with her pagan cultic worship. What about us? How many times have we seen God's acting in our lives, and yet we still not would not place our trust in God? How many times have we seen people's lives changed, and yet we still would not entrust our lives to Jesus? How many times have we seen others living a life abandoned, abundant, and yet we still would not abandon our sinful way and repent from our sin? These for devotion, even though both Rehoboam and Abiah had cried out to God each on one occasion, the writers of Kings and Chronicles gave a negative report card to both. In fact, after Egypt invaded Judah in the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, 12 years later, when he finally passed on, he was still called an evil king. 12 years. He could have done a lot to follow God after he has experienced the goodness of God. In 2 Chronicles 12, it says, he did not seek the Lord with all his heart. And in 1 Kings 15, Abiah was said to have committed the same sins as his father, and he was not faithful to the Lord. Both kings lacked exclusive loyalty to God. Both practiced idolatry on top of worshiping Yahweh. Now contrast that with Asa, the first good king and the first religious uh, reformer of Judah. He received a passing report card from the Bible authors saying that he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. This was specifically referring to the, um, the actions that he took during his two reformations before and after the victory against the Ethiopian invaders. He even removed his own grandmother from the office of queen mother. He also showed his devotion to God by dedicating all the plunders to the temple. Now it is one thing to remove idols and to repair the altar, but the greater need was to rededicate the people, to fill the empty void that was left behind by the idols with full devotion to the one true God which is why he called for a great assembly to gather in Jerusalem a retreat or revival meeting, which is exactly what our, our, our uh, um, adults are doing in uh, Mohawk. A revival meeting, a retreat. 
So the people would worship the Lord and renew the covenant with the Lord. Now, our God would not tolerate anything less than exclusive loyalty to him. Time and again, we are reminded that our God is a jealous God. This is not jealousy in the, in, in, in the sense of sin, but a jealous love over his people, a love that would not tolerate rivals. Imagine multi-wives or multi-husbands. Yeah, jealousy. It's like you and I are married to God. But when we worship idols, it becomes a terrible breach to the trust, to the covenant of God, like a wife or husband committing adultery. Now, as we conclude, I would like to ask all of us to ask ourselves the following questions. Listen carefully. Are we willing to get rid of all the immoralities in our lives? Do we have an attitude of humbleness and full dependence toward God's faithfulness? Are we ready to put away idols in our hearts and be fully, completely, exclusively devoted to our God? When I was preparing for this message, I read this following simple prayer um, by one of the commentaries. Um, and I think it is just an appropriate, simple prayer that we can pray today. If you answer yes to the three questions, willing to get rid of all the immoralities, willing to have an attitude of humbleness and full dependence, and wanting to fully, completely, exclusively devote to God, let us pray this prayer. Father, give me a repentant heart which responds quickly to your spirit's conviction. Give me the wisdom to see my sin and the humility to confess it in your presence. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. Amen. So did I uh, please keep this uh, on the screen? Because uh, it is our church practice to have communion in the first Sunday of every month. For those who do not have the cup, could you please raise your hand and our ushers will get you the cup. We gather as followers of Jesus. Oh, uh, one more. Sorry. So, uh, yes, in our tradition, the communion is for those who are baptized. And we gather now as followers of Jesus, and this is a time of remembrance, celebration, and reflection. And we remember together the death of Jesus on the cross for our sin. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection, and we look forward to his coming again. And we reflect on our relationship with God and examine ourselves. And the prayer just now on the screen is a tool for our reflection. So let's um, uh, take a few moments, a few seconds to reflect about ourselves, examine ourselves, and then we will remember together the death of Jesus and we celebrate Jesus' resurrection together.
Let's pray together in front of the Lord's table. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the bread and the cup. We know that they symbolize the flesh and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to remember always the sacrifice that our Lord made for us and help us to remember always your grace. May you lead us and may you guide us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we can now open the package. Now with the bread. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the, in the, in the night in which he, had, he was betrayed and took bread, and when the, he had give, given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. Now with the cup. In the same way, Jesus took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we can share the communion together here today. And we pray that we will always remember the meaning of Jesus' sacrifice, and we will continue to serve in a way pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's rise and sing the doxology. Let's receive the blessings of our Lord. May the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the peace to, of, uh, to Jesus Christ be with you all until he comes again. Amen. Now we, you may be seated and uh, meditate. <laughs> 